Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the chapel service. I haven't been here for a while, so you may not remember me, but I am Pastor Stu. <laughs> and Nan is the reader for today. Uh, I just want to thank you for all the prayers. I have not been this sick for so long. I didn't remember what it was like. And I don't want to remember. Uh, it's been three weeks. I know if I had antibiotics, but uh, we just don't heal as quickly as we used to. And I still don't have the energy. So I just thank you all for all the support and all that everyone in this church does. I'm really upset that I missed the Veterans Day on Friday. I understand it was outstanding. Uh, I wanted to be there, but this place does things that, as a veteran, I appreciate what happens here and remembering what this country was founded on. So did a great job there. Uh, also, I just had something from uh, church office. The flood buckets, not only did we, with the help of Galilee and the youth, put them together, send out 26 flood buckets, which I'm sure they went to the warehouse and they're now in Florida. Uh, you can almost count on that. Uh, but we were also able to send almost a thousand dollars and funds to help as well. So I thank you for all of that. Now I do have something and you found something in your bulletin. It's something I don't like to talk about. <coughs> Money. But we do have to be smart in how we operate. And so we're not asking for pledges. Uh, just an estimate because we still have to do a budget and figure out what our expenditures will be for the year. So if you want, you can fill one out, uh, whether you give, we give monthly, uh, I don't care if it's weekly, bi-weekly, I know somebody who gives yearly, it really doesn't matter. But if we have an idea of what's coming in, then we can uh, do a budget and stay within it, because that's the other important part. So when the collection comes around, if you would like to uh, do this, or you can put it on the table and back, whatever you want. But it is important for us to go uh, and tell. And, you know, uh, Brenda and I do tithe. Uh, you need to know that. Uh, but what you need to know about my lovely bride is she says that 10% is the beginning. It is not the end. So. We give 10% and then a lot of the others go to special things because that's what we believe in. This is a chapel glorifying God in worship, service, fellowship, and love. Let us pray. In the midst of continual change, God remains steadfast in God's love for us. God is creating something new, a new heaven, a new earth. Each day offers newness of hope and faith. Let us open our hearts and spirits to God's creative word for us that we may learn, grow, and serve as effective witnesses to God's love and power. Amen. Please stand in your able. We will sing our opening hymn, 428, for the healing of the nation.
seated. Please join me in a call to worship. The Lord is continually creating something new. We are part of that creation. We do, we do, we do, we do, we do. Through all this change, God is with us. Though we struggle and doubt, there God is able. Praise be to God who continually blesses us. Let our hearts, our voices, and our spirits sing God's praises. Amen. The prayer for confession. Merciful God, we come before you this day as those who are often afraid to confess all many ways in which you share us and betray you. You have given us continual opportunities to serve and love others. But we have withdrawn into lives of selfishness and greed. We have turned our backs on others in need. We have denied our gifts and forgiveness. Where can we turn now that we have brought from you? Your words are all called us to come home, to come to you when we are afraid, to receive forgiveness and healing. Open our hearts this day. God's anger is turned away, and in its place we find comfort, steadfast love, and forgiveness. With this hope, we can draw water from the wells of salvation with joy and thanksgiving. Amen. Our anthem today is in honor of the veterans, and it's called the Freedom Song.
religion. For these words of challenge and of hope, we give you thanks and grace. May they enable you to see the new lives that are probably both challenge and hope, bound together by your love. Amen. Today's scripture is from Luke chapter 21, verses 5 to 19. It's from the New Revised Standard Version. And it's called The Destruction of the Temple Foretold. When, when some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, beware that you are not led astray. For many come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, and the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds, not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and your wisdom that none of your op opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and siblings, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How many times have you looked around now, see the news, and think, this is it? Yeah. The end is coming. Of course, I think every generation has said that. I know when I used to work at the police academy, I had a young officer there who worked for me, and he was constantly coming to me because he knew I was a Christian, and are these the end times? <clears throat> Don't know. Of course, if you read the scripture, it says all of that's going to happen, and then some. It's not necessarily right now. Now, I have to tell you, I'm really not worried about myself. I've had a blessed life. So much. But on Friday in a celebration, I got to have dinner with my daughter and her three boys and my son, and then holding one that is not even three months old yet. Him, I'm worried about. Because we don't know what's happening. Now the picture here on the wall, I was, when I was thinking about this sermon, uh, Brenda and I went to England, I guess it's been five years ago now. Uh, and here, the people who built this, about 1200 is when this was built. Sometime after that, it caught fire. And I assure you, the people that built that never thought it would look like that. And this is a fairly famous place. If I remember correctly, uh, Sir Lancelot and Guinevere are buried on those grounds. This is where Joseph Arimathea's came with the staff, and that's there. This is a famous place. And yet, this sanctuary to God stands abandoned. That's why the disciples have a hard time believing the words that Jesus is saying. They thought the temple would stand forever. And one of the things we want to know is we want to know what the future holds. 
whether we are to invest in uncertain stocks or stocks, and I hope no one of you have crypto. <laughs> Trying to figure out what car you need. Do you want an EV? And if you get one, will you be able to charge it? What about simple things? Like what we can eat to maintain our health and try to move forward. Peering into the unknown of tomorrow is a perennial human activity. As we stare into the unknown, what are some of the things we can know for certain? For one thing, we know for certain, whatever is happening right now, whatever is real, is going to change. The great Greek historian Heraclitus said, you cannot step into the same river twice. Once you step in before you can get your other foot in, the river's changed. It's moved on. We can count on things as we peer in the future when we look at the past and how things have changed. I know with this group, all of us remember telephones with the rotary dials. How many kids could figure out how those things work? You know, think about that. Maybe you were on a party line. Now, since then, everybody has their own phone, push button. I have pagers down here. Anybody remember pagers? Come and gone. I guess we text now instead. Cell phones. A couple years ago, Brenda and I were coming back from the beach, and we were close to home. We were in Louisa then, and we were on 64. And, of course, we were between exits, and all of a sudden, traffic stopped. But without picking up my phone, I was able to buy voice tell, call Brenda. And it does. We're stuck. <laughs> yep. Think about how education has changed. Especially poor kids now. They don't have a chance. Religion, politics, science. I can remember my first PC. Uh, it was a Tandy, I think, and it came with, for those of you with a memory, with floppy drives. <laughs> and I upgraded mine and had a 10, I guess it's megabyte, hard drive attached to it, which was a box about four by four, six by six. <laughs> My cell phone has more memory <laughs> just operating the camera right now than that computer ever had. Think about the difference and the change in the world since 9-11. New types of warfare. News from anywhere in the world almost instantly. The river of reality is changing constantly. And we can be sure that whatever is crystal clear today will be obscured, changed, or refuted tomorrow. Count on it. In our text, Jesus is making a point with a dramatic fashion to his followers. And this is not just about something temporary. He was talking about the temple, the holiest and most sacred place to the Jewish people. Of course, Jesus was reading the signs of the time. With Roman occupation, he knew that sooner or later the Jews would rebel. It was coming. The extremists would force a revolution. And the stones of the temple would come tumbling down. And within 40 years, that happened. He saw with clarity the vision of what was going to happen to Israel. Same can be true for us. We know things are going to change. And sometimes if we pay attention to social and economic trends, we can predict where the changes will actually occur and what form they will take. Now, we don't have the clarity of Jesus' vision, but if we pay attention 
we can at least tell which direction the river is flowing in. Another perennial quality of human nature is the desire to know what we possibly cannot know. Jesus' words with their doomsday characteristics tell us and make us start to think about the end of the world. Not only do we want to know what's going to happen next, we want to know when these promises from Scripture are going to happen. When will the kingdom of God be fully fulfilled and finally come? When will the great injustices of society be cured? When will we see the Son of Man coming down from the cloud and heaven come here to us? How many of you read the book Left Behind or seen one of the dozen movies? It's a fictionalized account of the end of times based on the book of Revelation. But both the print and film industry produce a lot of material about end of earth scenarios. Remember Independence Day? How about there have been a bunch of movies about meteors striking the earth or comets or whatever. Of course, the ones having to do with pandemics, that's a little too close for comfort right now for us. Or how about the impact of global warming? Like I said at the beginning, if you look at the news, you hear about wars, Russians, back to the 50s and talking about nuclear war again. I'm talking to somebody the other day and remember going out and sitting in the hallway with our backs to the wall in case, when I was living in Arlington, if a nuclear bomb fell, <coughs> at least we'd all be sitting on the wall together. Um, <laughs> But we sometimes feel like the end of times are here. And the planet seems so much worse off than it did when I was a child. But I think a lot of that is we just know so much more about what's going on. Things we didn't used to know, and I wish I didn't know now, to be honest. But, but we don't know when Jesus is coming back. In fact, Jesus said he didn't know when he would be coming back. And even if we're not dealing with the end times, the climates, we wonder about our own life. We know death is in our future. We don't know when or how. I think most of us, the one thing is we'd love it to be in our sleep and not be prolonged. But it is a concern. And especially it affects us because it's personal to us. So we know things are going to change. And we cannot predict. But we know things are going to be different <coughs> downriver. But I believe God has a plan. A plan for history. Even if we cannot know exactly when or how it's going to come about. Albert Einstein once quipped, God does not play dice with the universe. There's an order, a purpose, a destination. I mean, God, what are we supposed to do? How do we live with life's uncertainties? Is it simply possible just to block everything out? What do we do with our anxiety over not knowing about our own mortality? The world may not end in our lifetime, but our life will not extend forever. First, we need to act on the best knowledge of what we do know. Over time, we have learned things from experience that we know are true. For instance, if we are married, then love, loyalty, and devotion for our spouse are things we know what to do and how to do it. If we have children, caring for them, loving them, meeting their physical needs and comfort, those are things we don't have to puzzle over. We know. 
For those of us who still have a job, working hard, honestly, trying to advance our employer and their things, it's not agonizing or difficult. Just show up for work, do your job. Wouldn't that be a concept? In other words, as we puzzle through life, looking into the unknown and unknowable, the best thing we can do is do what we know. What we know is faithful and true. And we need to enjoy what we have. Spend time with family and friends. See movies that make you laugh. Brenda and I tend to like light movies, and I love Hallmark. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, the world's dark enough. I don't know if you were minded all the bad things. Uh, we were watching an old one last night, Cheaper uh, by the Dozen 2, I think. Uh, and I have to tell you, one of the things about watching old movies like that, I love it when Brenda laughs. <laughs> you know, a simple laugh changes so much. And there are so many things dark, so it's nice to be able to sit back and laugh and enjoy. Sooner or later, life will disclose itself in a new form, a new reality. When that happens, we can respond accordingly. In the meantime, we should do what we know best from what we've learned from our past experience, and people we've had experience, we know what should be doing. Someone said that there are two days a week we don't have to worry about it. Yesterday and tomorrow. We live for today. One day at a time. Celebrate the present. Jesus' words about the end of the temple and the sound of persecution may not sound like the kind of future we want to enjoy. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Since we do not know what tomorrow can bring, we need to be prepared for the good and for the bad. No one could have predicted what happened on 9-11. Or how the world would change because of that day. Now we know. We say, I've seen in my day record-breaking typhoon in the Philippines, devastating earthquake in Haiti. Remember Superstorm Sandy? I saw in the news that people still don't have their homes repaired, which is 10 years now. We just had Ian. And what was the one that came after that? Nicole? Is that the one that destroyed the West Coast and now you destroy the East Coast? And does anyone have families and friends? We're praying with you for those people there. What devastation. And of course, we're still living with COVID. And if you have kids and grandkids, now RSV is something to be concerned with as well. Seems like the world's falling apart. And yet, what does Jesus say in the scripture? Stand firm, and you will win life. Seems like kind of a tall order, doesn't it? When literally and figuratively, the world is falling apart. Seems like a hard thing to do to stand firm. As frail creatures of the dust, how do we stand firm with all the upheaval and chaos going on around us? Let me tell you a story about a man who stood firm, followed on his promises. In 1989, an earthquake hit Armenia and killed over 30,000 people. One area was especially hit hard by the earthquake, and it contained an elementary school. After the tremor ceased, the father of one of the students 
raced to the school to see what he could find. He got there, he was stunned. The building was level. Looking at the mass of rocks and stones, he remembered a promise he made his little boy. He told him, no matter what happens, I'll always be there for you. Remembering that promise, he went to the part of the building where he thought his son's classroom was. And he started pulling back rocks. People came up to him, you're wasting your time. It's too late. All the children are dead. He refused to stop. Eight hours. Sixteen hours. Thirty-two hours. His hands are getting tired. His fingers are raw. He didn't stop. Thirty-six hours he continues to dig. After 38 hours, he pulled back a boulder and heard voices. And he recognized his sons among them. He called out his son's name, Armin, Armin. And the voice answered, Dad, it's me. I told the other kids not to worry, because if you were alive, you saved me. And then when you saved me, you would save them. Because you promised, no matter what, that you would always be there for me. There's an undercurrent to the biblical notation about the future that should answer our queries and ponderings. We believe that God created the world purposefully. There's an order to creation that suggests there's a plan, maybe even a dream. God invites us in faith to embrace that order, that dream. We may not know what tomorrow will bring, but we can trust that eventually God will make all things right. That's a source of Christian hope. Tomorrow may bring us personal tragedy. We may witness another national catastrophe on the scale of 9-11 or like the temple, church, falling. But these calamities do not define who God is, God's character. As we embrace the notion that God has a plan, then we are to embrace hope. And hope will sustain us no matter what comes. Looking through Paul's writings, and Paul is always writing about hope. Heraclitus was certainly correct. Life is like a flowing river, and we can never put our foot in at the same place twice. But the promise we have from God gives us hope. The river may change. We may change with it. And whether we deserve it or not, we have God's grace. We need to live for today and stand firm while the river of life changes around us. But God does not change. He is always with us. And he keeps his promises. You're blessed today because I can't say. But the grand old hymn, standing on the promises that cannot fail, where the howling storms of death and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises. Sorry, I can't sing now. 
Uh, please stand as you're able. We are going to sing a hymn 717, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory.
thank you for the many blessings that you have given us. Shall we offer mighty songs of praise? Shall we give of our abundance? Shall we again pledge our loyalty to God through lives of service and compassion? Yes, in all these things we shall offer our praise and our commitment to God. Each new day, each new opportunity is a blessing given freely to us. God's new heaven and new earth reside in us. We have come before God today proclaiming our faith. And with us, we each bring names and situations of those near and dear to us. We bring those before the throne of God's grace, seeking God's healing and redeeming love. We place our lives in God's cares. In all of this, we are part of God's new creation, meant to bring hope and forgiveness to all. Open our hearts, Lord. We want to be your agents of peace and hope. Open our lives, Lord, and help us work for you in this world so that the world may come to know you and that we eventually will have eternal peace. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our ushers can now come forward. So we give our gifts. Bless them. Bless the givers. And let us use them to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen.
Please remain standing as you are able, and we will sing our closing hymn, Forth in Thy Name. We'll sing all the verses. Because starting next week on the 20th, we are going to do the Angels of Christmas. Uh, so we're going to do an Advent study. I have a few books. Uh, if you want a book, they are $10. Because uh, we will meet next Sunday. And then it's Advent. Can you believe it? Advent. First Sunday in Advent, the 27th, um, we are doing our cantata as a service. What's that going to be on the 18th? On the 18th. So no preaching that day, so please invite people to come. Uh, and then we will have our Christmas Eve service on the 24th at 3 p.m. And then guess what? The 25th Sunday, we are meeting here and worshiping. For those who can attend, we only get to do this about once every seven or eight years or whatever. Uh, in my brief time in ministry, 10 years, it's the only second time that we have met on Christmas Day. So that's kind of the schedule. Maybe I'll put that in the bulletin one time so you can keep up, but it's coming and it's coming fast. This week, Backpack Buddies is restocking at, on Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Uh, we are also restocking the last Tuesday of the month. I believe that's the 29th. Please let Brendan know if you can come and for which ones. Um, we just don't know. You know, everybody's busy, I know. In fact, Brendan really knows about this Tuesday because i decided that instead of doing that, I'm going to the dentist. I mean, you got a choice. What would you do? I mean, really. Um, 
So she's going to need some help. Uh, don't forget our hunger relief, and this time of year it's really important. And those collections will be at the end of the month. Uh, this time of year, there's a lot going on. I mean, Thanksgiving's company. We sat down yesterday just to go over the menu. And of course, like probably all of you, figure out which family members can be there in camp, who's going where, and so <coughs> complex schedule. But it's also a time of joy and a time when families can get together and remember. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. The only thing we know for sure is that if God loves you, he's got a plan, and God will take care of you. That's his promise to us. We live your life to the full. Enjoy. We can have a good time and still do God's work. People think we can't do that. That we as Christians have no joy. They don't have a clue. Be thankful. And go, especially through this season, spreading the joy of Jesus Christ to all you meet. Go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
you can watch it. Because they both have if it's a, if it's depressing, I don't want to watch it. Well, yeah, it's depressing because it does, that's what it's going to be. I mean, actually, you can look around and say, this is the end of time, yeah? I know, I know. Anyway, listen, thank you very much. Maybe we'll catch up at some point after the whole yeah.